this is part two of the spectacular legend of the Rio Grande Southern Narrow Gauge Railroad. Howdy there, I'm Zane Lewis, and today I'll be continuing the legend of one of America's greatest and one of my all-time favorite small railroads, the Rio Grande Southern. For over 60 years, its engine serviced the towns of southwestern Colorado along a stunning 160 mile long route, becoming vital to the thousands of people living in the area. How was this line founded? What hardships did it suffer through? And what led to its demise? Previously, in part one of this series, linked in the description, we covered the line's beginnings and early years from the late 1880s to 1899. Today, we'll pick up right where we left off and discover the rich history around the line's operations in the first decade of the 20th century and what made this decade so important and special. The RGS's journey in the 1900s began in January 1900 when the small branch between Ute Junction, which was located near the community of Hesperus, and the Ute Coal and Coke Company was torn up. On the second day of February, a blizzard struck the rugged San Juan Mountains, the mountain range that the RGS operated in, and blocked most operations on the railroad, completely cutting off the important towns of Ophir, Telluride, and Rico. Yet another blizzard hit five days later, which undid the workers' progress on clearing the tracks. A little bit later that month, the rotary snowplows were put into action and cleared the line without much of a problem, which made management reconsider their original plan to sell rotary number one. In July, an engineer named Charles Talbert was killed when locomotive number two derailed near Mule Shoe Curve. A rescue train was dispatched from Durango, whose engineer was the brother of the slain Charles, and didn't learn of his death until arriving at the scene of the catastrophe. A few months later, on October 22nd, 1900, riding on locomotive number 19, engineer Frosty Williams was transporting a significant amount of ore through Burns Canyon, heading to Rico, when an air hose got loose, causing the train to lose a majority of its brakes. He whistled to set hand brakes, but unluckily for him, the train was moving too fast by that time. The conductor forced the caboose to break off from the consist and stayed with it, while the rest of the train piled up a little bit down the line. Fireman Bill Morrissey left the scene of the disaster with a broken leg, while all 14 cars were thrown down the hill. It would take the RGS several years to collect the dumped ore. Just a month later, on November 30th, arson was committed in Ophir, with over a half dozen buildings getting destroyed, including the Glendale Hotel. A warehouse exploded when the fire found some powder, and the flying timber seriously hurt a man shoveling snow on RGS Bridge 45A, the shoveling of which helped to save it. While a single freight car was burned, a steam engine successfully pulled numerous other cars away, saving the RGS its beloved trains. Entering into 1901, the Black Hawk Enterprise branch above Rico was barely used during the winter due to mining being sporadic and tons of snow clogging the line. On April 19th, a newspaper article was published by the Durango Democrat reporting on the founding of the Parents Peak Coal Mine and the construction of a four-mile branch from the RGS to serve the mine. The article also notes how the mine intended to own its own locomotives and rolling stock, operating them into Durango under the Southern supervision. Throughout the rest of the month, Snow slides consistently blocked parts of the line, while in May, RGS supervisor Thomas Wigglesworth was hired by the Boston Coal and Fuel Company to locate and build a branch at the line's coal deposits at Perrin's Peak. This branch line would ultimately become known as Franklin Junction, and it climbed a 4.5% grade along a 4.7 mile long route. To start out the summer of 1901, the highest river levels ever recorded since 1884 obliterated parts of track from Rico to Dolores in May, while a logging railroad was built to connect the RGS from A.A. Rust's recently relocated lumber mill, a project which would last into 1902. While originally only supposed to be two miles long, it was later extended into Bean Canyon. In November, the RGS transported one ton of uranium ore, which made a significant profit that experts believed could create future opportunities for the line. On November 15th, the RGS sent out a special pay train, and on the 25th, 
the Boston Coal and Fuel Company's line was officially opened, and their engine number one, which used to be RGS-35, pulled almost 400 excursionists over the line that day, using multiple of the Southern's flat cars fitted with benches. The next day, a head-on collision between two trains occurred near a place called Glencoe. The dispatcher had forgotten to alert the northbound train that the southbound freight was ahead of schedule, causing engine number 4 to be destroyed, and engine number 16 to get damaged. Before he could be fired, he quit. 1902 would prove to be a very dead year for the RGS, with mostly just the normal operations and natural disasters occurring along it. Sometime that year, A.A. Rust Logging Railroad that connected to the RGS was completed, with him renting an RGS flat car for 50 cents a day. In March, the Boston Coal and Fuel Company constructed a much-needed water tank near Franklin Junction to supply its operations operations, as previously, they had to rent water cars from the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. 1903 would prove to be a much more active year, with the bridge that crossed Pleasant Valley Creek getting replaced by a large fill that had been getting created for several winters. From February to April, the RGS had consistent problems with snow and rock slides blocking track. In June, north of Ophir, a bridge was washed out, once again knocking out part of the line. In September, the Southern's annual financial report was released, showing some small losses with freight services at $411,000. However, passenger train earnings were mostly the same at $104,000. In 1903, thousands of miners, represented by a labor union called the Western Federation of Miners, went on strike all throughout Colorado. Mine owners were vigorously opposed to the striking, and they were supported by the state government, especially Republican Governor James Hamilton Peabody, who used the state's militia to aggressively quell the problem. In September, union members walked out of the mills in Telluride, demanding a reduction in the workday from 12 hours to just 8. As a result of the mills shutting down, most of the mines also shut their doors for the time being, as they had nowhere to send ore to. When the Tomboy Mine tried to reopen with a non-union workforce, the WFM posted armed gunmen around the mine's yard, preventing it from reopening. As a result of these strikes, in November, the mine owners asked Governor Peabody to send in the National Guard so they could reopen the mines with strike breakers without any chance of problems happening. After receiving a report from a committee led by Colorado's Attorney General, Nathan Miller, Peabody asked President Theodore Roosevelt to send in army troops, however his request was refused, causing him to immediately send in 500 Colorado National Guard troops, who were transported into Telluride on the 24th by the Rio Grande Southern. After a series of arrests, deportations, and court battles, the guard left Telluride on January 4th, 1904, and by that time, the mines had all reopened using imported non-union labor to save themselves from any future problems. In December of 1903, the RGS began to have serious problems finding serviceable trains, with the car shortages causing a major 20% cut in coal and lumber shipments, as well as parts of the track needing to be replaced. In January of the new year, a freight train running from Rico to Durango dealt with poor brakes during the night, causing it to run away, with it finally stopping near Pine Ridge. After intense debate by the crewmen, the train continued, however it once again ran away, this time stopping just a little bit outside of the town of Durango. On March 1st, free cars carrying uranium oxide were shipped from Dolores, with their destinations being New Jersey, New York, and all the way across the ocean of France, of course completing their journeys along different railroads. While throughout the rest of the year, rock slides would occasionally block service along the RGS with a bridge getting damaged in August, in 1905, gold was discovered near Hesperus, and a two-mile long route was built to the side of the mine, paid for by the May Day Gold Mining Company. The RGS then retired all 60 of its stock cars, which had been purchased from 1891 to 92. The railroad would use Denver and Rio Grande stock cars until it bought 38 more cars from the Colorado and Southern Railroad in 1938. Sometime that year, a group of Arizona businessmen came to Durango in an attempt to potentially build a line from the mines there all the way to the ones at the towns of Bisbee and Marenchi, Arizona, as the mine owners in those places desired cheaper gold. However, this arrangement failed, and the businessmen then purchased coal interests at the now ghost town of Dawson, New Mexico, and built two railroads the El Paso and Northeastern, and the El Paso and Southwestern, to Arizona. 
Both of these railroads would later get bought out by the famed Southern Pacific Railroad in 1924, and Dawson became a ghost town in 1950. From February to April, the Rio Grande Southern was consistently plagued by snow slides, with parts of the line getting shut down for days at a time, and even a snow shed along Lizard Head Pass collapsing. On April 19th, two passenger trains, one near Rico and the other south of Mecos, derailed, with thankfully only a single injury occurring. The Rio Grand Southern once again suffered flooding problems along the line from May to June, which seriously hindered operations along the line, as parts were totally blocked and track washed out. It would take until July to finish repairing the damage. In September, yet another RGS train derailed at the exact same place as a wreck that had happened in April. The derailment was deadly, with 27 people getting injured, and a woman, Mary Weddell, dying a few days later. In October, a DNRG branch between Durango and the New Mexican town of Farmington opened for service, which would eventually lead to oil shipments beginning over the RGS a few years later. On the 21st, the Silverton Standard reported about a train wreck along the line near Placerville. Baggage man William Cuthbertson and engineer Dad Phillips both suffered minor injuries while everyone else was okay. About five hours later, a wrecking train from Ridgeway was able to clear the site. In December, the RGS finished constructing a new Y to replace the previous Y on the Dolores baseball fields. On the 24th, a fire destroyed the railroad's bunkhouse at Vance Junction. To start off the new year, the RGS suffered a calamity when a fire destroyed the roundhouse at Ridgeway, along with two steam engines. A new roundhouse was constructed shortly thereafter, however that would not be the end of the line's troubles, as snow slides would block parts of the line twice over the next two months. On May 9th, 1906, just next to Bear Creek, conductor Robert Heyer was killed in a wreck, and other disasters such as fires and washouts plagued the line over the summer. In June, the Denver and Rio Grande surveyed a route from Dolores through Paradox Valley all the way to Cisco, Utah. However, the New Mexico Lumber Company purchased timber holdings in the area, which blocked all other logging operations, causing the survey to get discarded. On August 25th, a construction crew was working on Bridge 57A and stopped to go to supper, believing the bridge to be safe, an assertion that would prove to be false. Soon a train arrived, and as the last few cars rolled across it, the bridge collapsed. Conductor A.K. Brown was killed in the ensuing collapse, while two brakemen jumped to safety, however were injured. The maintenance foreman was promptly fired. By the fall, A.A. Rust Lumber was depleted, forcing him to cease operation on his railroad line that was connected to the RGS, along with his mill. In December, the RGS had removed the branch and sold the right-of-way to the Montezuma Lumber Company. The crossing at Rust was torn up by the Southern two years later, in November 1908. Before the onset of the new year, the Montezuma Lumber Company began to construct a logging railroad near Glencoe. Eventually, by 1913, over 25 miles worth of track had been built, however the tracks were frequently relayed. The RGS occasionally used the line to save time while loading ties. The RGS also leased a branch owned by the Utah Fuel Company, which they continued to operate until it was abandoned in 1926. The mine that the line serviced supplied the RGS with about 40 cars of coal a week, and with up to 80 cars of coal for the DNRG. Just like in many previous years, the RGS had a rough beginning to 1907. In January, an accident on the Kalamut branch killed two men named Raymond Andhir and L.E. Ware, while seriously harming engineer Ellis Roberts. On the 30th, an eight-car train was going down Keystone Hill along the Telluride branch, however lost traction on the snowy track and became a runaway. The train derailed with no injuries. Locomotive number 19 was nearly destroyed, but repaired later on. However, its tender was left at the site, likely until at least 1984, maybe later. The freight cars and flanger were totally obliterated, although at least the explosive powder the train was carrying didn't explode. In February, six RGS flat cars were bought by the Montezuma Lumber Company for $100 each. The Southern had originally gotten them from the DNRG in 1891, and they were in such horrid condition that they had never been furnished with either automatic couplers or automatic air brakes. In late March, two Denver and Rio Grande lumber cars were finally rediscovered after having been hit by a landslide near the RGS town of Ames and taken almost one-fourth of a mile into the canyon beneath. Not many other significant things happened to the RGS for 
throughout the rest of the year, mainly just the normal disasters and achievements. At the end of the year, on Christmas Eve, five worn out cars were destroyed. Entering into March 1908, a southbound freight train collided with a switching engine along Lizard Head Pass. While there were only minor injuries, for over three months, a machinist's refusal to work kept locomotives number 2 and 20 out of operation. At the end of the month, a fire severely burned a bridge near Hesperus, and two months later, the RGS suffered a major setback when a bridge at Lost Canyon burned, which forced that part of the line to shut down for over a month, and in June, yet another bridge burned, this time 9 miles away from Mancos. Just three days after the fire at the Mancos Bridge, on June 8th, both it and the Lost Canyon Bridge were rebuilt, and the line reopened. In August, 15 steam locomotives had driver brakes installed, and the fill that had replaced a bridge across Pleasant Valley Creek five years prior was totally washed away by a flash flood, which left almost 200 feet of track hanging 70 feet in the air. Entering into 1909, on an unknown date in the year, the two mile long branch between U Junction and the U Coal Mine was abandoned, while in early January, on the 23rd, pretty much everything that could go wrong for the RGS went wrong. A train with five steam engines was trapped at Ophir, and a snowslide at the town sent four boxcars into a canyon, while train 11 was encased in snow at Rico. Near Montalores, a train derailed, and when crews tried to free the locomotive that had fallen off, the flanger derailed as well. Multiple bridges, such as Bridge 64A, were damaged or completely buried as well. For the next few weeks, Weeks, snow problems continued to cause trains to be delayed, and a few months later, in April, a locomotive was wrecked at a bridge weakened by floodings, severely injuring a brakeman and killing fireman Charlie Talbert. In the summer of 1909, the Rio Grande Southern business car called Rico was wrecked after it was a part of a pay train that derailed and was totaled a second time while en route to the Denver and Rio Grande shops at the town of Alamosa. After this event, Superintendent C.D. Wolfinger renamed it Montezuma because he was still upset about losing his bank teller job at Rico over a decade earlier. On June 16th, most of the Lizard Head snowsheds were destroyed by a fire, along with seven loaded freight cars and a snow flanger. Between 15 to 18 men from a passenger train from Durango destroyed the shed to keep the fire from spreading and then formed a bucket brigade. A telegraph message was soon sent to Telluride. On August 13th, an RGS passenger train headed by locomotive number 25 ran over a washed away fill at Starvation Creek, which had left the tracks hanging in the air. Thankfully, the train didn't fall into the creek, however it was suspended over it. In September, heavy rains resulted with two Telluride power dams bursting, and the ensuing floods wreaked tons of damage upon the area, destroying RGS track at Trout Lake, between Vance Junction and Placerville, and washed out the Ys, railroad yards, and engine houses at Rico. In the fall of 1909, Otto Mears, the pathfinder of the San Juans who had originally founded the railroad, was hired to rebuild the RGS in the areas it had been washed out. He supervised the construction from his former personal business car, the Edna, just as he had 20 years earlier. At Trout Lake, he oversaw the building of a section of track around a washout that became known as Otto's Puzzle. Being solely accessible from the south, the Telluride branch of the RGS reopened on October 25th, while a little over a week later, on November 5th, reconstruction began on the snowsheds along Lizard Head Pass. On November 29th, a new engine house at Rico was finished which replaced an older one, and tracks were laid to and from it just a few days later. The Y and yards at the town were transferred east of the main line, and towards the south end of the yard, a new coaling chute was built. The total cost for all of this work was an astounding $24,680. In the final month of the year, a mile-long aerial tramway was built by the Alta Mine, and a large tramway terminal was built over the Rio Grande Southern's tracks in Ophir and thanks to the completion of flood repairs dealt by the bursting of the Telluride power dams in the north, the line from Vance Junction to Placerville was reopened. The total cost for the damage dealt was a ridiculous sum of $134,000, a little over half of which was paid for by the power company. And with that, the Southern's decade was completed. Throughout the early 1900s, the RGS faced the same challenges that every other railroad faces, and it withered them all. Despite numerous floods, snowslides, train wrecks, and other disasters, the Rio Grande Southern persevered, continuing to service the farmers and miners along its route, while adding to Colorado's history and lore. 
The towns of the San Juan Mountains relied on the railroads in order to survive. Whether it was the Silverton Northern Railroad at Animus Forks, the Denver and Rio Grande at Uray, or the Rio Grande Southern and Telluride, the mines needed the trains to transport their goods out to be smelted and sold. The farmers needed the railroads to transport their sheep to market, and the economy that the San Juans relied upon never would have been possible without the Rio Grande Southern. In part three, the RGS will continue to face its many ups and downs throughout the 1910s and 20s but also be faced with new challenges. World War I, the Spanish Flu, and the Great Depression. And just like the challenges that we've covered in parts 1 and 2, it would find a way to survive while continuing to make the history books and creating a beautiful legacy that will never die. Yeah, the early 1900s were quite a time for the Rio Grande Southern, weren't they? Despite it being relatively small when compared to the Southern Pacific or Colorado and Southern, the RGS made a major impact on the lives of those who lived in the San Juans. The Southern offered a unique way to ride the train and see the world in all of its glory. While by no means the most influential, the Rio Grande Southern stands apart from other railroads thanks to the insane scenery it once traversed over 70 years ago. And today, you can still see its remains, raw, untamed, rugged, and beautiful. And thanks to the preservationists and ordinary rail fans just like you, who still care about our great American history, the legacy of the RGS will continue to endure, with its structures and cars lasting for years into the future, and the men and women of the Rio Grande Southern will survive into eternity. I'm Zane Lewis, thanks for watching. Thank you for watching part 2 of the legend of the Rio Grande Southern Narrow Gauge Railroad. As I stated in part 1, this series will be made up of 4 individual parts to save viewers time, and so I can cover as much as possible. In part 3 of this series, we will cover the Southern's history in the 1910s and 20s, documenting the line and its responses during some pivotal points during American history, such as World War I, the Spanish Flu, and the Great Depression. In part 4, we'll cover the line's history throughout the 19th 30s, for World War II, and until its demise in the early 50s, and what remains of it today. Please be patient as I work to bring you parts 3 and 4, as I make these documentaries entirely myself, and producing them is very time consuming, given my time schedule with work and school. Hopefully, we can finish the series by the end of the year, but until then, I will make plenty of side content to keep you satisfied, as I upload lots of short videos about trains, abandoned mines, and gaming things, and I will 
will likely make documentaries about things such as ghost towns and mines in between now and then. If you would like to know the progress of this series, feel free to ask in the comment section of any of my videos, and I will happily respond. I will also post updates about my progress on my community tab section and occasionally post video previews of what the documentaries will look like. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can catch them right when I post them. Thank you for your patience, and have a great day.